In the last video, we had a look at when you need to apply constraints like ending at XI with dynamic programming problems. In this video, we're similarly going to look at when you need to use 2D tables over 1D tables. As with that last video, this is a concept that relies on intuition that needs to be built through practice, but we'll work through an example to show some ideas in this video. We'll be looking at the longest common subsequence problem and a couple of variants of the knapsack problem, and we're going to assume some basic knowledge of these. In the longest common subsequence problem, we're going to have two strings, A and B. We want to find the longest common subsequence between these two strings, where subsequence means that the matching characters don't necessarily have to be contiguous. For example, in the sample input above, A, B, D, F, I is going to be the longest common subsequence. We're mostly interested in the length of the longest common sequence, as the solution can be trivially extended to allow the subsequence itself to be found. So first, we're going to try to create a simple prefix of the problem. If L is the length of the longest common subsequence in A and B, then we'll let L of I be the length of the longest common subsequence in A 1 to I and B 1 to I, which means we only take the first I characters in strings A and B. So let's try to work through an example with this and try to create a table and figure out the recurrence relation for this problem. We'll start from the back of the strings as our goal is a recursive formulation. I is equal to I, so this is a good start. We have a match and we can add one to a previous subproblem solution. But when we move back one column, there's no longer a match. And here we run into a bit of a problem. We have F and H. We might be able to find a good match using either F or H, or we might need to go back even further. When we find a match, we're not going to be able to use that character again. And since the subsequence must appear in the same order that the characters appeared in A and B, it means we can't use any of the characters that appeared after it. So using a single parameter starts to get very limiting, as we'd have to cut off characters from the other string that might have valid matches, and it's starting to seem quite intractable to define an elegant recurrence relation that's going to find an optimal result. Most importantly, the subproblem does not know which characters will come next. So when we're indexing with a single parameter, we can't know in a given subproblem whether using a later character in the string greedily will end up precluding the selection of characters later for a more optimal solution. What we really want is to be able to independently test using either f or h, and have these as our subproblems. By splitting up the variable i into i and j, such that a is tracked with i, and b is tracked with j, we'll be able to formulate subproblems that allow us to independently scan for matches across the two strings. Since we've introduced j, this problem now uses a two-dimensional table, so let's have a look at how this table gets filled in. Along the x-axis, we have the characters in a, and along the y-axis, the characters in B. In this table, we're going to be checking for a match, summed with the solution to the previous subproblem. The previous solutions for the subproblems are found with lookbacks in the table, so we want to fill this table in in dependency order, going through each column one by one. First of all, Z is not equal to A, so we're going to start with zero. A is equal to A, so we get a one here, and we'll fill in the rest of the column with ones, as the longest common subsequence with the string B and the character A is A, with length 1. In the next column, Z similarly doesn't match with B, so we start with 0. In fact, there are no matches for Z at all in the string A, so let's fill in the rest of this row for simplicity. Next, we know that A has a match with A and B, from looking back at the previous subproblem, so we get a 1 here from looking back horizontally. Whenever there is not a match, our lookbacks can go either vertically or horizontally, taking whichever is highest. Next, B matches with B, so we're going to add 1 to the previous subproblem solution, but we can't reuse the character B anymore, so for this look back we're going to move diagonally for 1 plus 1 equals 2. The rest of the column can then be filled in vertically, as we know that we can't be 2 while B is just of length 2. The character C does not appear at all in the string B, so this next column is just going to use the non-matching horizontal lookbacks. D will use the horizontal lookbacks until we introduce the character D from the string B, here we will add 1 to the diagonal lookback, for 2 plus 1 is equal to 3. The rest of the column can then be filled in using the vertical lookback. With A, we get another potential match, and we'll fill in the table as such, but as the character A has already appeared earlier, and other characters have appeared between these occurrences of A, this new A won't really be material to the optimal solution. This is clear for the rest of the table, where we use the horizontal rather than the vertical lookbacks. This is a really good visualization of why the two-dimensional table and separating the variables into i and j works well for this problem. For f, we're going to use the horizontal lookbacks until the letter f gets introduced from the string b, where we once again can use the diagonal lookback for 3 plus 1 is equal to 4, and then fill in the rest of the column with the vertical lookback. 
The final character, I, uses the horizontal lookbacks up to the final character, where we get a match and find the optimal solution length of 5. The recurrence relation follows from the process we just used. Adding the second variable, j, gave us a new degree of freedom, which allowed this elegant recursive subproblem formulation that just wouldn't have been possible with a one-dimensional table. In general, we need to add a new variable and move to a two-dimensional table when the natural recursive approach for a problem is actually dependent on more than one variable. Usually this means there's going to be more than one input in the problem, but this characteristic of a dynamic programming problem is just as much dependent on the definition of the problem as it is on the number of inputs. A good example of this is the knapsack problem, and comparing knapsack with repetition to 0-1 knapsack. These two problems use the same inputs, but they have a slightly different problem definition. In knapsack with repetition, we want to try to fill a bag up to the capacity B using items from X, but we can reuse those items in X. The natural way of defining this recursively is based on the value B. If we take an item, the capacity of the bag is reduced accordingly, and then we can take another item, and that includes taking another instance of that same item that we just used to further reduce its capacity. The recurrence relation therefore looks something like this, where the recurrence uses the items, but the lookback table itself is parameterized only by the capacity. In 01 knapsack, a new constraint is introduced. We can only use an item once. This variant gets its name from the fact that we can either not use an item or use it, 0 or 1. As in knapsack with repetition, we're still going to want to parameterize by the capacity, but we also need a mechanism to prevent the reuse of items. An easy way to do this with our subproblems is by including an index i related to the items. It's going to narrow down the items in the subproblem that we can consider. At i of 4, for example, for any capacity, we can choose to take the item of weight 12 or not. If we take it, then when we look back, we need to restrict that item from being used again, with an i minus 1 in the recurrence relation. If we don't take it, then it must mean that it's an invalid or suboptimal choice, so we will similarly want to look back at i minus 1. The overall recurrence relation looks something like this. In this example, the addition of the constraint around reusing items necessitated the extra variable and the two-dimensional table. When faced with a novel problem that you don't know how to solve, it's good to start with a single dimension and a direct prefix, and only introduce complexity like the second dimension when it's clear that you're going to need it, and why you might need it. Practicing problems and building intuition is key to getting good at dynamic programming. As you do this, you might start to immediately recognize when you're going to need a two-dimensional table, and exactly how you're going to use it. I hope you learned something from this video. If you liked it, please consider liking the video and subscribing to my channel. I'm making videos about dynamic programming and other subjects that you might encounter in an algorithms course. Thanks for watching.